Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll call to order the Board of Library Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, February 23rd, uh, 2023. Um, can we start off with a roll call, please? Yes, Vice Chair Joshi. Uh, here. Trustee Moreau. Here. Trustee Silvera. Here. Trustee Petty is not here. Try. He's having trouble getting on shortly. Already, uh, 2023 um, consent items. Um, can uh, we start the first off with a roll item? Call, on, and the only item on the consent yes, agenda is Joshi. approval of minutes. Right I will entertain a motion and a second to approve unless anyone's got corrections or discussion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All righty. Um, uh, roll call uh, vote, I guess. Yes, thank you. Vice Chair Joshi. I approve. Trustee Moreau. Yes. Trustee Silvera. Yes. And Chair Falguth? Yes. And Trustee Petty is absent. Yes. Um, we're now at the part of the agenda for public comments. Uh, this time allows the public to speak for a maximum of three minutes on any subject not on our agenda. Any person or group desiring to bring in an item to the attention of the library board may do so during public comments or by uh, addressing a letter of explanation to our library director, care of Monterey Public Library, 625 Pacific Street, Monterey, 93940. Um, and welcome, Bob. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to address the board? Hi, Bob. Thanks for your patience. So just in the chance somebody is viewing from home, if you're not joining us here in the council chamber, you can also view this on youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey or on Comcast channel 25. Please note that there is a delay on both of these and it is best to join on Zoom so you'll be connected in real time. To make a public comment, you may dial toll free 833-568-8864, enter meeting ID 161-352-8864, followed by the pound sign. If prompted to enter participant ID, press pound. To make a public comment, please click on the raise hand button on your Zoom toolbar. Chair Felguth, there are no public comments at this time. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, the next item on the agenda, oh, Harish? Let's say for the record that Bob has now joined the meeting. Yes. Uh, Actually, I was I was on the meeting by telephone and I heard you, but <laughs> the picture wasn't there. And for some reason, you didn't hear me shouting and shouting that I was there. So I was there from the very beginning. Uh, Good. And, uh, thank you, Francesca, for, I think it said, promoting me to be a panelist from <laughs> just a average <laughs> everyday viewer but anyhow i was there from the beginning thank you harish great thank you bob uh next item on the agenda is a uh, our public appearance item item number two second reading and adoption of library board policy 105 use of library meeting rooms um and brian i assume you'll take the lead on this sure thank you uh, chair felgood um, as we did our first reading last month, we discussed this, you know, changes to the board policy here. And um, one of the things was regarding speech. It was regarding essentially the hate speech in use in there. So I attached the guidelines for American Library Association on here. If you look at the packet, page nine um, through page 14 on here. But specifically, what happens is that the library becomes from a limited public forum to a designated public forum 
when you continue, when you start offering public meeting rooms, when you offer community meeting rooms. So with the designated public forums, that's where you start um, going into the First Amendment. So this, I, I would highlight um, point number two, which is must a public library provide meeting rooms to the public? And on this, the second part, um, you know, we're not all public libraries are obligated to provide a public meeting space, but if you are, so in the section, the third section there it says public libraries that open their facilities to public use cannot disadvantage or exclude speakers or groups from using their facilities solely because they disagree with those parties' views or the content of their speech. A public library that opens its facilities for public use may not exclude a group from its facilities to avoid controversy or public disapproval. Um, and then follow up with that in, is on number seven. And that's, can libraries deny a group access to meeting rooms? And there's a part, the first part stock talks about eligibility guidelines for them. But then I would like to highlight the reasons for denial must be reasonable in light of the policy, apply equally to all individuals or groups, and cannot be based on the organizer's views, backgrounds, beliefs, or the content of their speech. Meeting rooms policy should include a means of appealing a decision to the library director or the governing body of the library. So with that, just want to state that the um, we go back to having in the policy, the highlight of library policy 515, disruptive behavior in the library. So by having the policy that if you're disrupting the library, if you're and linking it to that allows us to, um, you know, go in and we would be able to monitor, we also have the ability to monitor any public meeting that's in there. But really, if if the library doesn't agree with the views or, or generally with something, we can't exclude them from using a, a space or you know coming into the library in general, unless they're coming in there to incite violence or do something that would um, disrupt basically the other people's use of the library in the building. So I don't know if, if folks had a chance to kind of go through this or if there was any questions on that ALA um, guidelines to that. No, it's primarily related to the hate speech element. Yeah, I, I just, yeah. Yeah, Marcia, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah. so if, just for clarification, so you, you if you had, it's like a, quiet group of Nazis, that's okay, if, if, <laughs> if that's okay. Well, I'm, I'm kind of comparing this. This is a really helpful document. Yes. I was comparing it to uh, the policy. And so um, it, it, kind of, it, it kind of sounds as if a, a library can decide that they're not going to have certain kinds of meetings there. Um, and so you talked about, um, meetings of informal education or cultural nature. So that if, for example, somebody wants to have a birthday party there for their kid, that's doesn't, you have decided in the library that you're not gonna do that and that's fine, right? Get right. a birthday party. Or if the chef's club wants to meet there once a month, you you could say, um, no, we don't wanna have the, the room tied up every Tuesday, you know, the first Tuesday of every month or something and, and you can't, right? And you could also decide that you're not going to have any political meetings there, right? Or because it says informational, education, or cultural. <laughs> so if if a political party decided they wanted to have their meetings there, you could say no political parties, right? Because Marcia, where are you reading that line? Well, no. I'm looking now a policy. At the policy. I'm looking at the policy and at the Q and A that says. The library can decide to not allow certain generic groups to right to use the library. You just can't do it on the basis of beliefs or something like that, right? Right, Mark. Uh, you know, Trustee Morrell, you're correct. Which is basically, if you were to say to, um, if there was a group that was funded by a, a political organization that says we want to do an informational program related to this speaker. We want to do an informational program. That's an informational program. But if you're doing a political rally, a political rally is not the same kind of, uh, uh -huh. of an event. And the 
birthday parties are a private event, where are those informational, educational, or are they cultural? Right. So really those, that's why you're filling in those things of just saying, I want to have a, a rally or mm -hmm. some, something like that, that's, I'm mm -hmm. there to collect names. That's not the same use of that room. So really those people, people will have to, um, you know, when I think putting in the application, what's your group and what's the nature, the, the way I've built in kind of the, the program right now for the, the tentative booking program would say, what's the nature of the um, program that you're booking? And, and that you don't get automatically accepted. We have we can follow through and say, what is what are you actually and, doing? And if it were religious, if it's a religious informational, like all about this religion, then that's okay. But if it's just to get together use to of that room, pray so or something, people, people, and that's not like a church service, that's not acceptable. Is that correct? Correct. And that's the thing is that the way I would say that the church groups over the time have there's been right several the lawsuits for churches say, against public libraries for disallowing them to hold mm -hmm. churches in public libraries. You could allow, they're allowed to use the libraries as a as a community group, as a nonprofit group, but it's not a place to hold traditional services. It's a place to hold informational meetings or a community meeting of some sort. So, so those lawsuits against libraries have been unsuccessful if they wanted to just hold services. So that's the precedent that has been set. Well, they've they've been they've they've been successful, successful. in suing basically in being excluded for for using their for being told that you are a church. So policies that that exclusively say churches or political groups are excluded when they when you clearly state that a group is doing it and that's because that's identifying them as a group and it's not identifying what the nature of the meeting is about so identifying them as a group and then saying you are not allowed to have free speech because you are part of a, a specific identified group that's where you run into first amendment issues yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob? Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm reading into Marsh's comments uh, a frame of reference with which I agree completely. But in uh, item nine, in that, uh, uh, what's the big reference uh, document that we got here? Mm -hmm. uh, ALA. Mm -hmm. Who? Uh, it's the meeting rooms QA. American the, Library Association. Oh, yeah, American yeah, yeah. American Library Association. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in that, item nine, I have highlighted, uh, item nine is headlined, but it says, should a library exclude politicians, elected officials, and partisan political activities? And, um, and then in, in the middle, it says, partisan campaign events may be inconsistent with the library's mission and should be addressed in the library's policies. Um, is that quandary uh, specifically dealt with in the proposed policy that we're reading and voting on? Because, I mean, if the, um, oh, let, let, let's say the uh, county democratic uh, caucus or something wanted to meet in the library, uh, even if they say, well, we're just going to present information you i mean you'd have to be asleep not to know that that's going to be partisan in some way um and the the fact that they state what maybe 99 percent of the people in the world would consider the fact if it's a particular political group presenting it for public consumption i i think that clearly more than implies that it's a point of view of that group and uh, this here says uh, uh, partisan campaigns may be inconsistent and should be addressed. So I guess that's the an issue that um, you know passed through my mind at our last meeting. And uh, this Q and A uh, answers a lot of questions I had. But that, and I think that's where Mar Marcia was coming from, is, mm -hmm. to me is still unresolved also has the city attorney had a chance to take a look at this document and expressed any concerns no so actually i actually shared this with the city attorney after our last meeting 
I shared this document with the city attorney and I um, highlighted some of these sections and they were okay with the with the policy. Um, so I, I shared this the link, the document for the ALA yeah. guidelines here. And I can I see what you're talking about, uh, Trustee Petty, too, you know, on the section nine. And I do think that's partially why all of our programs in our policy basically say this program is not you have to say this sponsored by the city of Monterey, not sponsored by the library, that that's part of it is that this is not limiting the free speech. So the content, if you're doing a, you know, an informational session on, on specific topics, I think, you know, we can offer space for people to do informational topics. And are you part of a, you know, following up with those same kind of questions? Are you a government agency? Are you a nonprofit organization? Are you a community group? or as an individual, who is the one that's kind of, who is the host of this? It's, and that's where we want to know that and then the, the topic of the of of their meeting for that space. Bob? So, so, so would our out, as it were, be that, uh, let's say the uh, local democratic organization got permission and they presented information at this meeting. Um, and maybe without uttering the words, I think it would be implied that anything that they state as correct information uh, would rep represent something that the, in this case, my example, the Democrats would want us to vote for. Is our out of not appearing to be partisan, the fact that, hey, if the Republicans or the Green Party or anybody else wanted to have a similar meeting, they could if they wanted to. And if they, choose not to, then, you know, they just have missed out on the opportunity. But that um, in addition to the fact that neither the library nor the city are endorsing anything, um, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic in looking at what the nuance and implication is, implications are. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering, is our out the fact that groups with who might present different statements of fact about the same incident or event or philosophy or point of view or program, uh, they, they can do that too. And uh, whether they choose to apply for time at the library or not is, you know, initially up to them. I'm wondering if that's our kind of, you know, covering our butt. It is because then it becomes, it's the designated public forum aspect of it, which is, it's a, your there's a the, the community room is a designated public forum and it's a space for groups that want to talk about informational and community groups so we're we're following through with with that side that um but the i think the other part about this would be to have the staff reviewing the programs coming in and giving us we're giving a period of time for us to review the application before it's automatically submitted so for example, if there's something coming up, which is a topic, it could be that we say, you know, this might be a good discussion point. You know, if there's a very hot topic coming out there that we know is going to be on the, uh, you know, on a ballot, you could, you could say, well, why don't we do a candidate forum or why don't we do something like this to this aspect? And that gives the library the opportunity to review you know what comes in there and that's why i plan to have the reference librarians reviewing this so that they can actually see what kind of groups are, are responding what kind of programs are they asking for in the community room and then they could steer them to whether that's a library kind of guided does this fit with our mission and we want to partner with them or is it something where you know we should have other groups out there or is this just okay you're just going to use the room and do you not fit in the description here and we'll let the people know. Harish? A question about what you're saying. <clears throat> so let's say that I held a meeting in the library to talk about why you should vote for the TOT. Is that professing a position or is that information dissemination? Uh, dissemination. dissemination, sorry. Well, I, I would see that as a if you're doing it as an individual, you're doing it as an individual, and it's possibly 
you would have an informational meeting. Yeah, but you, we would not be on our calendar. You wouldn't be on a library program. That would be your own thing where you'd say, I'm doing a, a meeting about my, you know, my personal beliefs on the, the TOT. You know, that's your that's your personal beliefs on the on the TOT and doing a program there. That's how I that's how I see that on there. So that does not conflict with the uh, policy then, is that correct? No, I, I don't see that as, as I don't see that as as conflicting because that falls under number three programs and meetings of an informational, educational or cultural nature. Um, sponsored or hosted by other government agencies, nonprofit organizations, community groups, or individuals. This is a if it's a if it's a designated public forum, you have your freedom to say what you believe on there if you're not affecting other people. Now if you're a campaign and you're trying to gather votes and gather signatures and get people in there, that's could be a different uh, a different kind of avenue right there right if you're an avenue and, and trying to collect political signatures for people or collecting things um but it's the same reason you know for example people are allowed to stand outside of businesses and collect signatures for voting on state uh, legislative issues people that are filter that's part of the first amendment speech where you're allowed to gather um you're allowed to gather signatures in different places in the community. So you'll see those people in out front of grocery stores and coffee shops mm -hmm. and all around because that fits into a, a freedom. Would that fit into a, a, with a group that says, and after we present information, uh, we want to collect signatures uh, on a petition, would that nix their application for our space? You know, I'm a, I think there is a, I don't think Trustee Petty, I do not think so. I'm, I'm looking on here, I'm looking through the policy one more yeah. time. I have seen in, in certain policies that there's no collection of signatures or no mandate. There's no, I've seen that there's voluntary collection of signatures, but I, I in certain policies, but I have not seen mandated. So I've, you know, there's things like where I've seen people, a lot of libraries allow voluntary collection, but not mandatory collection of signatures. Well, I wasn't thinking, I mean, if you walk out of Whole Foods and there's somebody with a clipboard, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a volunteer. I, it's, I have the freedom to walk past them or stop and sign mm -hmm. it. And and that's not what I was talking about the um, the requirement of it by a group. But uh, if at the end of the meeting they say, oh. "Now everybody who wants to support this, come up here and sign on the petition," mm. um, is that okay or not okay? Now I'm just wondering if they said meeting adjourned, we'll be out on the sidewalk with a clipboard if you want to sign mm. our petition. Then you know that's that's that timing makes a difference to me. But uh, if they make it as part of their meeting, then that's where I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's going back to the different meeting room policies that I've reviewed. The voluntary has traditionally been okay. The voluntary signing of, of information, but the mandating of, of signing information. So if you basically said, you've, you've attended this and now you have to sign that you, you, know, you checked in or you have to do this, that that would wouldn't be allowed in in, the, in a public library space, but a pub you know signing in because if somebody says I I want um, you're doing a a talk and sometimes people say I I'm a an author talk and if you want to be on my newsletter sign this sign up you put your email on this newsletter list that's kind of similar so I think having it where if you allow it for the the author with the newsletter, you have to allow it for the other group using it for their purpose. So that, that becomes- uh, Yeah, I, 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 can, I, I can see a, a group offering the audience the opportunity to sign up on a list that would say, I want more information about this. Here's my email, send it to me. And mm -hmm. th that, that way 
it's voluntary. The person in attendance isn't um, saying they agree or disagree. They just are saying they want more information about whatever the topic was. Um, and it, I mean, it's it's not dissimilar from when we have library events. Sometimes we ask people who are just walking in the door to sign up. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, just like uh, somebody, according to the Brown Act, just I mean, not Brown Act, uh, Robert's rules or Rosenberg's rules of uh, conducting a meeting. If somebody from the public wants to say something, they are asked if they would state their name first, but they're not required to. And so I would assume that anybody attending any program, whether it's a library program or an outside group that we've given permission to, could choose not to sign in if they didn't want to. Um, and you know that's that's pretty clear then, you know, they're kind of like a fly in a wall, taking it all in without revealing anything they don't want to. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, we we because it's a because they're free and open to the public because the meetings have to be open to the public, and that you have, you can't deny somebody uh, access yeah. to this to the. Group. Mm -hmm. Let me just say right now, if if we uh, pass this new uh, policy. Uh, I have three or four very quick answers to which will be very quick, more operational questions than conceptual questions. So I'm going to hold off on those. But I just have a few things that I want cleared in my head if we do pass this new policy uh, for the library. Do any of the other trustees have questions or comments? Go ahead, Janie. Um, I just, as as the newbie, um, our role as trustees is to approve um, the policy, but as far as the procedures, now we don't get into that. Is that correct? That Brian and his staff will come up with those things and that's not our purview? Yeah. That's... Um... I'll say on that, Trustee Silvera, that's actually under implementation and enforcement. It's consistent with the other policies there. Um, so there's the library director will establish rules and procedures for implementation of this policy, including an application form, reservation and scheduling process, check-in and check-out procedures, inspection, statistics, et, et cetera. So that's on page 16 at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, that's on. Okay, great. Are there any? Oh, go ahead, Marcia. I just had one, one other quick question. So if they say a Girl Scout troop says, we want to meet here every month for the next five years, you're, you allow recurring, there's nothing against recurring meetings, or, or, do, you, or do you, as as long as they understand that they could get bumped if the library had needed the room for something. Is that correct? They're not going to have any standing meetings unless they are a library or a city meeting, and that's the kind of up I, items one and two kind of on the priorities mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. really what they'll get is a rolling six-week booking so what i'm trying to get away from is a you know that's a four to six week booking depending on on the rolling period which is that we have people that say we want our group to have this because there are a lot of community groups that meet you know first friday mm -hmm. of the month at exactly. you know, whatever restaurant for their board and we we can't uh, we can't have somebody that says we we kind of have the library space every yeah. month first friday or second friday because we will need it for other events and other things going on exactly and we don't want to go through that process of bumping them for consistently in that exactly so so you can do it on, in procedures by saying we only allow uh, six mm -hmm. six weeks in advance so therefore you can't book it for the year Great. Yeah, so, that, that so, works really well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the booking procedure is what I have is I have it set. You can set like the certain number of minutes or a certain number of hours, all of those kind of things within a month. And then you set when the timer resets for all of the bookings periods on all of these rooms so that people will, because they're registering by email. And if we see different groups that are, if they're trying to get around the policy, we can email them directly and say, sorry, this is canceled or you need mm -hmm. to, you can't have 
one person booked it for the group and then the second person book it for that group and then a third person book it for the group <laughs> so that you take over the room right, right? we just we want to make sure it's open so anything yeah so people don't want a longer thing that's really library related so i think that's the thing mm -hmm. if it's library related then it's going to be a partnership and we'll have more opportunities to have them uh, book further out great thank you Perfect. But Brian, if it's a rolling, let's just pick six, you said four or six week period. If it's a rolling six week period, then all I have to do on behalf of my group is send an email in every single week for six weeks in advance. So you don't get, but you don't get every six weeks. You get, you can get, you can get two bookings within a 30 day period, but it's yeah. just, it's one of those things that books out. I'm just saying that the groups that say, I want first Friday, 10 a.m. every month. We can't confirm that because we're not going to confirm you on the schedule. Now, if that right. date is available, then potentially no one else is using that consistently. But there are going to be months out of the year where we're going to have summer reading programs. Mm -hmm. We're going to have other things out there throughout those months that are going to conflict with other people's programs. So it's just a, a procedurally wise, if there's only a couple groups that are really using the meeting rooms moving forward, then possibly they will run into, yes, I'll, I'll find the same meeting over, but they won't be able to just basically put to their members or other community and saying mm -hmm. every, this date from, you know, from February through December, we have booked, we have confirmed. They don't mm -hmm. have it confirmed. They can try to confirm it, but they don't have it confirmed until 30 days or to 42 days in advance. Hmm. What, I mean, we were talking about uh, how far in advance, how close to the day they want it. Uh, what's the, in other words, what's the minimum time we require for a booking before we allow them to come in? Do they have to do it at least a week in advance, three days in advance? What? On the other flip side of that coin. Let me let me log in real quick. I believe I have it set right now at five days. Okay. Minimum of five days in advance. And that gives us time, especially yeah. because of close two days over the weekends, it gives us time to receive something and review it and get back to somebody. Well, plus staff are going to be involved and we can't just spring uh, you know, and a new meeting or some added responsibility on them without enough lead time for them. So that's why I was wondering how, you know, how close to the day they want it can a group wait before they, uh, uh, it's you know, they've missed their chance. And so you say five days in advance. That's not work days for the library being open. Five calendar days. Five calendar days. And I will say. This is specifically the community meeting room. Now the solarium, which is also included in this policy, but that would be the small groups. Those are people that really you're booking this as a smaller group and it's, you could be using it for a meeting, a Zoom call, you could, you could open it up for the public, but it's really more a, the, the request that we're getting for the smaller groups to kind of use the room. With a small group room, we could book it up to the time before, because really that it's just a open the door, let them in, and then they're they're in and out. It really the solarium doesn't have the same requirements and the cleanup and takedown that the community meeting room does. So that's why the community meeting room has a five day, and it has a um, it has to be mediated by staff for approval. So there'll be an automated message that says, "Please wait for a response from the Monterey Public Library for our." Uh, mm -hmm. for what we are going to decide about your booking. We're in the solarium, we'll have an automated approval period and it will also be tied to the two bookings at a time. So it will have the same thing, but it'll be registered by, because we're also ad asking people for their library card number so that we can go through and look back and seeing if people are just um, trying to book multiple or trying to weasel around to get more time than what they're allowed. And um, is there a limit to the amount of time per meeting that can be requested? I mean, basically, the rooms will be available any hours that the library is open. And, and if, if I want to have a three-hour meeting, mm -hmm. can I request that and expect that I might get it? Or is there a time limit per meeting? 
Yeah, so what I have setting and I'll, I'll work these out. These are part of the things because they're operational, we'll be working yeah. them out and clarifying them as we move forward, as we open. But as to start, um, what I had set up with the large community meeting room was hourly bookings with a limit of four hours <laughs> at a time. Yeah. And for the solarium was hourly bookings with limits of two hours. So there was a smaller uh, <laughs> use of that so that people aren't using the solarium as their personal office all day long. So so a group could have two four hour meetings per month. Correct. Okay. Just checking my arithmetic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Chair Felguth, there are no members of the public at this time. Great, okay. Um, if there's no more discussion, I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Do I have a second? Thank you, Harish. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Francesca, can you call roll? Yes. Um, Trustee Joshi. Approved. Trustee Moreau. Yes. Trustee Petty. Yes. Trustee Silvera. Yes. And Chair Felguth. Yes. Alrighty. Thank you. And I imagine procedurally as we work our way through trying uh, and opening it up and seeing what comes up. I imagine we'll be hearing from Brian and staff and there probably will be tweaks along the way when we see what we're dealing with. Um, Bob? Uh, Brian, one of the, I mean, some of those operational questions we already uh, got to because Marcia brought up uh, a couple of things, but I was wondering, um, it's very clearly stated in our policy that the library doesn't do any publicity. The group whose application for time and space mm -hmm. is responsible for that. Uh, does the library require any submission of what they're going to uh, send out to the public by way of flyers or uh, publicity before uh, it's okay? I mean, do we have some kind of stamp of approval of that? So there's not a mandate on there, but I did allow on our booking form the allow the submissions um, with the, I said, I put in there attach draft of flyer here. Mm -hmm. So there's a there, there's the ability for people to put in a, a draft flyer there so that we could, you know, go through there and say, no, you can't put our logo on there or no, you can't put the city logo on there, or any of these things without approvals. So yeah, I just I do have it on there, but the way oh. the the way the booking form works, it we can't make that submission mandatory, unfortunately. But so we can follow obviously through with we're requesting it. it. Yeah, we're requesting on their side just to see if, if they can. As, and and similarly, we make very clear in the policy we just approved that it's up to the uh, group using the space, basically to clean up after themselves and leave the room as they found it. Um, are we asking for any kind of damage deposit before the event uh, in, in case the group is irresponsible in that regard? No, um, we're not. And I think because that gets into a kind of a credit card and a credit card hold and a return and whether they have a cash and daily cash hold and what you hold on to it and then returning cash to people and if you have somebody that's registered from the group and then says, well, the president from the group put down the 250 in cash and can you give it back to me? I'm the secretary. I think that opens up some, a little too much on there. Uh, I do believe if we were to go forward in the future with more hours, like if we were to revise this policy in the future to operate outside of library hours and having that, I do think that would be, uh, a good way to, to do something like that because then you could say a hold because if we were to, let's say, call or a higher janitorial or hire additional staff for that and then a person cancels, we have still hired people to do work on their, on their thing and the deposit would cover the cost of doing specific labor associated with opening a, a room before or opening it af after hours on that, on that side. So I think those kind of 
that may fall more into place outside of regular hours. And finally, the last line in our uh, policy says the library reserves the right to attend any meeting held in its facilities to ensure no unlawful activities are occurring on library premises. Um, <clears throat> when there is a group having a meeting, will that then necessarily take library staff away from what they would otherwise be doing on the job? Because they have to, you know, we want them to monitor what's going on in the community room. So I, I don't think staff will sit through every program, but mm -hmm. especially there are slow times on the reference desk as well. There are, you know, we, we, we run into these cycles where it gets really busy and there's multiple phone calls and people in line. There's also lower times. So I think just walking in and just having people step in and try to take a couple minutes to, to walk in there and either it could be one of the managers or reference staff, I think would be helpful. So they would be taking away from possibly something else, but it's really part of more kind of knowing what's happening on the floor when you're when you're scheduled on the desk. Well, paradoxically, by uh, ceasing the uh, outdoor book pickup service, uh, one of the reasons for doing that, besides the lower use of it, was that uh, I heard over and over again that it ties up a staff member sitting there by the the uh, doorbell and now we have a person who isn't sitting by the doorbell anymore and you know maybe there's a little extra time available for staff then to uh, and I, I hope we make it known to groups that staff members will be peeking and checking in and not so much as being a cop or a, you know but just to understand what the meeting is uh, what's taking place mm -hmm. under our roof. Thank you. Um, shall we move on? Item number three, receive update on fiscal year 2023-2024 budget process and provide direction to staff. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so we had our budget preparation kickoff meeting yesterday for uh, City of Monterey. I can give you just some time, rough timelines on there. The um, our revenue projections are due tomorrow, so I'll be working on that tomorrow after the bookmobile. Um, the position changes requests, new hardware, software. Uh, building maintenance requests for public works, those are due on March 3rd. So those are coming up fairly quick. And our packets are due in, um, for all of all of our, our packets for the department are due March 17th. Mm -hmm. So between that, our next meeting for uh, Board of Library Trustees is March 23rd scheduled, which is after the next, um, the deadline for the department packet. And then the the departmental meetings with the finance department is between um, April 3rd and April 14th. And then we're looking for um, April 26th for a study session with city council. So that's a rough timeline just to kind of start off with where, where we are with the, um, with the budget there. So I don't have the kind of the projections right now, but thinking if there's any, anything here with the, uh, with the trustees about past practices and processes for um, working on budget highlights for the upcoming fiscal year. Yeah, go ahead, Marsha. Um, I think typically we did have a sort of subcommittee that could work with Brian so that if he needs to get some guidance from the board before the next meeting, you're talking about two people. I think I, I think typically we did do that. Uh, and Bob, you can confirm whether that's correct because you've been yeah, I think that, me, but I, I I I remember when when I when I was chair and vice chair we did that. Yeah, I, I think that's generally true with regard to a lot of <laughs> major topics like budget. Uh, and my recollection, and I might be wrong on this, is that it was the chair and vice chair. Mm -hmm. I think it, it could be, you know, but yeah, I think it needs to be, like you said, two people. So. Okay. 
And so, yeah. Brian, would that be helpful if, if you have access to Harish and myself? I believe so, yes. And I, okay. I think if we would want to, um, basically, do we want to just have the, the chair and the vice chair, you know, a subcommittee of that to, to work on the budget? Um, do we need any kind of special budget meeting for here for the Board of Library Trustees or just to bring it back to the March 23rd meeting, which would then um allow me to bring it back to the the packet back to the you know city finance department which is you know as i was mentioning that i'll be meeting with the finance department between april 3rd and april 14th i'm trying to remember what we did last year we have had special meetings of the mm -hmm. board strictly for budget reasons before but i think it was a function of the timeline as much as anything else yeah mm -hmm. uh, because you know, dates were coming up where uh, the director had to meet with the city officials and our next meeting wasn't going to fall in time for us to all talk to the director about the what we how we wanted to guide uh, his or her presentation to the city. Mm -hmm. So if the timeline works out, and especially if Jennifer and Harish have been um, in contact with Brian between now mm -hmm. and then, then I think I think it wouldn't be necessary to have a special board meeting uh, if the time works out that we can, as a full board, discuss it and make recommendations and provide guidance before the director needs to meet with the city. I, I believe that was the issue. Yeah, I think we did that last time. Uh, Nat? I, I agree with uh, Trustee Petty. I, I think in past years what we've done, because the timeline is very tight, uh, rather than having a formal subcommittee, which we try to avoid, director works with the chair, vice chair. I, I have in the past been part of those conversations and then bring it back to the board. If it can be uh, on a regular meeting, great. If we need to have a special meeting, like uh, Trustee yeah. Petty said, it, that, that would be appropriate. And it sounds like between now and then, we're not gonna need such a meeting because you know, the budget process will still be in process during the March, at, at the end of March and maybe even at the end of April. So seems like we're okay. Plus we've established some priorities of where we know where we wanna go. So it, it's just following what we've set up more or less. So, yeah, so that's the rough kind of timeline for everything coming up and um, happy to meet with the uh, chair and vice chair. And mm -hmm. if we were, I think we could probably set up those times off this call if that's appropriate and we'll connect and set up some times for us to meet virtually or in person, mm -hmm. however you'd like to meet. Okay. Um, can I just ask one, one quick question about the budget? Um, and that is that the content management system, are you, are you gonna ask, are you gonna put that in the budget as a regular budget item or request for that? I, I believe so, and I can tell you that the, it actually came in lower than I expected. Mm, so the cost for the content Excellent. management system for I will just we'll work on those as a highlight. But really, um, I'm thinking is I believe 3,600 annually. So that the oh, it was initially I thought it was going to be ten thousand dollars, and I was told six thousand dollars, and then it's great. you know 3,500, which is every time you get a lower price, that's great. You know, yes. that's, <laughs> so that's in the recurring cost that would be great you know yeah. so especially for software software keeps jumping up in price so yeah. those are all part of I, I think an ongoing um and i have a com i've had conversations with our isd about you know some of the technology and, and needs moving forward okay thanks all righty um are there any members of the public who wish to address this particular item there are no members of the public chair call booth. Thank you. Alrighty, we're moving into informational reports and staff comments. Item number four, receive library and museums director activity report. Thank you, Chair Felgood. Um, yeah, so we have our, if you've seen the, the packet, um, I was just gonna go over some of these items, but we had our children's librarian, Bianca Navarrete Lopez. She just started last Thursday, February 16th. So she has been um, watching our on-call children's librarians and following their um, guidance and just shadowing different people on the desk. So you may see Bianca out on the desk working with some of the other librarians 
please say mm -hmm. hi when you when you stop by the library and welcome mm -hmm. her here to Monterey. Um, Cannery Road Days, this is gonna be scheduled for March 11th through April 20th. We will have a flyer coming out shortly. And Andre Scarza from the library has been working with me on that along with uh, Susan Schillinglaw, um, Tim Thomas, uh, Gregor Caillé from the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, Rebe Rebecca Mosto from the Western Flyer Foundation. So it's we're really tying it into the Western Flyer, the return of the Western Flyer mm -hmm. in the Sea of Cortez. Mm -hmm. So um, we just got a stack of 75 books from Penguin that they mailed to us as mm -hmm. support, which is great of the Sea of Cortez. Um, but um, we'll, March 11th will be our regular tour date for the Pacific Biological Labs, but that's the day that Steinbeck and Ricketts left um, mm -hmm. out on, on the Western Flyer was March 11th. And March 12th is going to be an activity at the Japanese American Citizens League Hall. So you'll see that on the flyer. That'll be our kickoff date over there. We'll have different Zoom programs, a nature journaling program, and Tidepool Discovery Activity at Lover's Point with the PG Natural History Museum and Western Flyer Foundation. So that's going to be at low tide. So at the end of April, you know, about mid-April, there's a low tide date. So we talked about doing the nature journaling and then leading that off to people that partner with the PG Natural History Museum because they're a great organization too and leading um, walk from them. So I think it's gonna be a good program and a, you know, a good series, a lot of great discussions with the team so far. Um, yeah, moving forward, as ISD to move forward with the procurement of content DM for our digital content management system. It sounds like that may go into place and then um, contract possibly next week we're looking yeah. at for that. So I am happy to see that kind of starting to go forward and where we'll be able to go in the next couple of months with starting to build up collections. Our Biblioteca self-checkout machines have been shipped back to the vendor. So that has finally been completed. And our summer uh, events and game plans related to the theme, find your voice. So you'll see just a little um, octopus on there on the packet that I drew on that. Um, for part of it, we'll be doing some different events and programs this year. The, there's an article should be coming out in about a week or so from the Cormel Pinecone, along with uh, Mike Sovereign, John Sovereign, and the artist, the muralist, Natalia Carraza, regarding our terrace mural. So I believe they're going to have a, a um, I think on the March 3rd, 2nd or March 3rd edition, they might have some highlights on art. So hopefully that article will be in there. The um, the library terrace, we've updated all the furniture out there. So if you've seen that, it's mm -hmm. bright and shiny, welcoming up there. And our friends and foundation, been working with them. I believe we're at 234 people registered for chocolate and wine for this Saturday. So great um, number right there. And been meeting with the team regarding the final transitions to the new library website. So trying to work through different kinks and integrations on there and working with Kim on uh, libguides for that, what we're gonna use moving forward. And you know, met with Black Gold regarding our early learning hub and Stronger Together grants and walked through with our facility staff regarding um, putting forward some changes to the children's areas and possibly the community meeting room for um, through this grant. And I was at that State of the City event on February 15th and presented to the Kiwanis Club regarding children's services on February 15th as well. So, and yeah, we have our collection assessment for preservation grant assessment for Colton Hall in the old jail, um, March 6th and 7th. And I'll be working with uh, uh, Jordan from our museums and two assessors regarding looking at are we store our collections, facilities, everything needed in those um, in Colton Hall and the old jail. And we had our project kickoff meeting regarding the expanded path of history with Paige and Turnbull. And we'll be looking at underrepresented groups in Monterey. And I know our Japanese community is one of the groups that we are looking at highlighting. Um, and our Buffalo Soldiers exhibit, you may have seen Jordan on the, uh, in the local news, there was a little a bit about the Buffalo Soldiers exhibit and how they were stationed in Pacific Grove in uh, while they were here before they left for Yosemite. And what we, we've ordered our new mannequins, got our 
outfits tailored and working on getting some new displays there. Mm -hmm. So those should be showing up in the uh, uh, Presidio Monterey Museum, hopefully by April is what we're looking at. And also in the packet, I designed some new shirts for the Pacific Biological Labs, as well as some um, enamel pins so we can sell those in the stores. Mm -hmm. So that has been fun. And been, we are CSUMB, the service learners are starting to come in right now. And then finally with museums, uh, Jordan and I met with the uh, NEDCC, which is Northeast Document Conservation Center for Ready or Not California. This is about conservation of historic resources. Um, NEDCC actually has this available for libraries through a California State Library grant. So normally mm -hmm. they have hired people out on the West Coast to work through basically what are your practices um, for conservation? What is, do you have a priority list for if there's a fire, what do you grab? So at Colton Hall, a lot of these things we do have. So it's like, what's first, what's second, what's third? What do you, what's most important? What do you tell the firefighters about using water versus this and you know all of those different aspects of there so we walk through luckily colton hall there's not a lot in the second floor at least in the museum there's really not a lot of power <laughs> so you know it's really like candlelit there's so um we walk through through a lot but they thought our practices actually for colton hall were really strong made a couple recommendations but overall just a very uh, positive kind of experience so we're just looking at best practices there for our museums. And yeah, then also there's a couple of photos in the packet just of the completed mural and the space. So with that, any questions or comments, happy to answer. Bob? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, first off, uh, Brian, uh, congratulations on uh, continuing uh, to follow through on one of the four things you told us when you were interviewing for the job, and that was to get involved in and with the community mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> almost everything that you've uh, uh, presented in this report and in other reports uh, is an example of how uh, the library is really looking like a uh, central place for community activities. And um, so I just wanted to say, I wanted to commend you for that. Um, couple things. Uh, before we started meeting only remotely and we had uh, staff attending our meetings uh, in person more, um, what, one thing that I think Inga and I started was we had a staff member attend each board meeting and just give us an update on what he or she was doing, what their uh, activities uh, that, for which they were responsible uh, were looking like uh, recently and how they're going and so forth. So I would just make the request to, to that uh, I, I know Bianca just started, but uh, you know the children's librarian is a position that we have talked about in terms of how important it is. And so I would request that maybe as soon as our next meeting, uh, she could come. <clears throat> And you know, be one of the very first um, agenda items, and just introduce herself. And uh, I mean, we could probably read a bio somewhere, but it would be nice just to chit chat with her for ten minutes and find out how things are going for her after a month, and offer any help that the board might be able to provide, and that sort of thing. So I would request that. Similarly, uh, whether it be at the same meeting or later, I would like uh, to. Uh, David and whoever else would be um, appropriate come and fill us in maybe before the rest of the world on the new website and what changes and improvements are going to be uh, part of the new website so that if uh, somebody saw me at Whole Foods and they said hey Bob you're a library trustee what's with this new website I didn't want to go yeah so uh I'd ask, I'd ask for those two items be in future um, agendas. Also, if we go down to uh, packet page 23, where there are the two photos of the terrace, uh, <clears throat> number one, uh, I, I think your choice of furniture is outstanding. And 
uh, it looks to me like it's the kind of sort of like all weather stuff you can leave out. You don't have to pull it underneath or into a storage closet just because it's raining. And the top picture, I just want to comment what it reminds me of. <coughs> Living my high school and college years in Southern California and right up against the um, adjoining Pasadena and right up against the San Gabriel Mountains, it was often said that you couldn't see, you wouldn't know there were San Gabriel Mountains right almost in your backyard, except for one day a year. And that was the first of January. And when you look on TV and you see the Rose Parade, you always saw these beautiful hills there. <coughs> the rest of the year, it was just a like a cloud of dirty air of all the smog <laughs> blowing down. And when I saw this top picture of the um, terrace there, and I looked and I saw those hills and the clouds in the background, uh, I wondered if you photoshopped it from one of the um, uh, Rose Parade uh, photos or uh, if maybe we can count on it more than once a year. But uh, I often told a good friend of mine who went to Redlands University, the cover of their college catalog had a picture of a university or college, Redlands College building with a background like that. And I always said, Marv, that's a lot of baloney. You never see that in the uh, hills above Redlands. And like I say, once a year above Arcadia, where I lived in Pasadena, you saw it. And so that's just a, a, a wonderful uh, shot there, not only showing the new furniture, but uh, the background. So um, that's all I had to say about that and those two requests for uh, people visiting us at future meetings. So thanks. I appreciate it. I think, thank you, Trustee Petty. I will note, I had talked a bit to Andres actually about meeting, coming out to the next meeting specifically because he's spent some time working with Dennis and he's had mm -hmm. more time working here with the community that I said, you know, I don't want to, um, for this meeting coming up here, I said, I don't want to throw you <laughs> like right under the, the wheel so you don't know what's going on, but let's set up some time because we brought mm -hmm. Mary out a couple months ago from yeah. our book deal and that was really, I think she did a really great job presenting here for, for the board. So I think Andres, because he's been working on a lot of different local history requests and making a lot of great connections over the past couple of months because of in his role, so many people come up to him for very specific requests, either researchers or writers, you know, uh, community members and different areas all around or Big Sur, you know, Carmel, people are calling all around to get stuff from him. So I think he's, you would have a lot of great information uh, moving forward. And he's been working on some great projects. So I think once we get into the next month, because then we'll also be in Cannery Row days, he may have kind of a, a good presentation just fully of like what's going on, how we can help, and what he's learned here in his first couple months. Yeah, and I, you know, <laughs> I, I agree. Looking at what he's uh, come up with, it looks very good. And I just wish that his uh, local history programs weren't on the exact same day and time as our meetings, because I'd like to be at the one today, but here I am. Well, that one got canceled today, it did get canceled. Oh, but, I didn't know that, but yeah. at, at any rate, other yeah. ones he's had, you know, on the fourth Thursday at four o'clock, and I go, oh, crap. <laughs> and Brian, you also have a uh, an intern there, right? There's no reason why he can't also tell us what he's been up to. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, there's a list of people, but I think the thing for him is sometimes with class schedule with because mm -hmm. he is a MIIS student. So mm -hmm. the days of his when he can come here is sometimes limited based on class schedules. But absolutely. Yeah, there are different people I think that we can bring out here to kind of talk and I think it'd be great. You should all feel well. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item number five, receive financial reports. Thank you, Chair Felgood. Yeah, so we will see here we are moving along um, in our in our expenditures. And as you see on this, the youth services um, was low, and that's because we just hired the children's librarian. So mostly that was the, the staff costs on this were the part-time seasonal, the on-call, as we, as we call them here, those staff being, being brought on here. So, um, but I think we are operating pretty well here on, on budget. And um, yeah, we still have space and for more collection purchases this year. And 
overall, I, I think even our, you know, like our reader services, youth services, those are kind of low. And I do think also one thing I will need to fix in next year's um, fiscal year budget, and I'll be working on this, I'll, I'll communicate this with Chair Felguth, Vice Chair Joshi, is I think some of the staff are in the wrong um, fund division. So that's why we see like a 61% we're in at, you know, at reader services at 35. It's because the staff are put are in the wrong uh, budget field. So we will fix those kind of things in the next um, in next fiscal year so that it, it comes along. Um, so we'll be streamlining the process. Right. Uh, yeah, Trustee Moreau. I, I just had a quick question about the library trust fund. The library administration, I know that our fundraiser person is in there, but is that all? Are there other positions or other support that's being paid for for the trust fund that maybe? There, there are, um, and I can pull up the budget too. There are basically three uh, PTS that are that are on their, uh, on calls that are under the library administration. Our communications person Ilana, um, and who's also in the library administration and Tula. So all three of them are in the um, out of the trust fund on that support side. And let me look over here to the, let me, I will pull this up too real quick. But yeah, those, those three specifically, the staff are pulled out of there. And then there was a period of time when um, Dennis Copeland, when he was also out of the trust. So there was a, there was a, a set amount that was set aside for Dennis. So that's why there was, um, that amount. I mean, the the actual amount here, and I can pull up that. So yeah. Something else, something else, just to remind trustees about is that the um, library material budget is a good portion of that, at about a hundred thousand dollars. So it's not all salary. Oh, okay. So, so you mean under the administration figure is, is correct? Yes, it, I will say is it does include includes different things like postage, printing, supplies. There's also some different uh, risk management, workers' comp. So there's some other kind of associated costs, and they're not just salaries. So that's where, um, even though we've, you know, had a specific amount in the budget for. Um, library materials we've been spending right now for library materials out of general fund first before going into the trust fund. Right. So, so, so maybe that's something to look at in budget development is that some of that stuff that's in the trust fund maybe ought to be in the general fund instead, or at least we could ask for it. Yeah, we'll, we'll just, look at just, the, just think thinking about not. Yeah, I think looking at the percentages and what's the appropriate amount for collection mm -hmm. and what's the appropriate amount for some of the staff or the fields for some of them, I, I think are are a good thing to look at for, for us. Right. Okay. I think we talked about this when we were developing this year's budget, um, that these were some of the things that we were going to be looking at um, as we move forward and things started opening up again. So you're right. So try to get now's the time. Just, right. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. All righty. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the statistical report. And my dogs are having a fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you'll, you know, we are back up to our. Um, luckily, after all this, you know the. Poor weather. I think still the attendance is still slightly going up. You know, it's going up a little bit each month, which is great to see out there. The um, I will be interested to see because we're moving back from four self checkouts for a period of time back down to two. How that's going to work? Um, mm -hmm. But the you know the percentage of self check usage is great to see. I always love to see that mm -hmm. because it's showing that the technology is easy to use if people are able to go there and check out by themselves, as well as the app is continuing to go up slightly each month. So it's at 528, which is nice to see that it's those kind of services are uh, useful for the public, that they're you know paying their way by offering those out there. 
and that our library cards are going up, you know, so sort of about 355. So we've had different class visits. We continue to have class visits here in the library, which is great to see those uh, kids coming back. And yeah, um, computer usage is, is pretty steady. The um, programs for adults, you know, you can see right in there and attendance at the youth programs, at the adult programs, the um, offsite programs, and those I believe are some of the, you know, some of our bookmobile programs on there too. So all of those, you know, we'll continue to work on increasing these. We did um, make uh, just an error that we didn't have zero volunteers, just, just FYI, so that we, uh, <laughs> but just that, just a, um, a small edit, and, you know, uh, but we had 38 volunteers with 278 and three quarters hours. So around pretty, we're pretty steady around on the volunteers, but as I uh, like to say with my staff, yay, we made a mistake. Because <laughs> if you didn't make a mistake, you're not human. <laughs> and so it's, we are, <laughs> well, it's how you respond to it. Just say we owned it, we made a mistake on here, but it's a, um, we do have we do have our volunteers and we love having them here in the library. So with that, um, in, we still have our comparisons here from 19 and 20 as the as the board has asked, but happy to answer any questions here. Um, yeah, I, I thought we had asked for 19 and 23. Just to compare before pandemic mm -hmm. and after. I, I don't know why we would want 20. I think that we talked about that last time, unless I'm totally confused. No, you're not confused. And I'll just step in if you don't mind. Is that oh, a have. clarifying question that I yeah. want as well? Last year we provided you with the 2020, 2021, which provided you still with the pre-pandemic. And if you'd like to receive that same report, then that can be included. This one was pulled since it was um, when that hadn't been provided. However, um, as you said, Trustee Moreau, providing the more recent one right before the pandemic. The question will get to be once we get to March mm -hmm. and the pandemic of 2020 will not accurately reflect yeah, may, maybe we just don't need it anymore. Um, That's what I'm we, wondering. We were very interested in the recovery coming back from the pandemic. But since, first of all, we're still technically sort of in a pandemic, we're kind of inching mm -hmm. along and that, you know, we're, we're kind of far away from 2020. I don't, I don't know, but I'm not sure. What, yeah, I'm not sure what this is telling us, and I'm not sure it's it, that we need it, and maybe it's more work than it's worth. Bob? Yeah, to that point, uh, uh, if, if we were going to look at uh, the data from past years, and we could, and to, at least for a, a while, compare pre and post uh, pandemic, I would say we don't need 18 and 19. The, 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 on today's chart, it's February to January 2018, 2019, and then similarly for the other years. I would say the, the 2018 to 19 is unnecessary, but the 2019 to 2020, February to January, gives a good uh, idea of what the 12 months almost right before the pandemic hit and we started shutting things down. So mm -hmm. I think that would be a valuable year. And while I have the floor, I, I notice in the, the first chart on uh, the packet of page 28, uh, comparing last year compared to the, um, I mean, the last 12 months to the previous 12 months, uh, and uh, you know, a 50% increase from 2021-22 to 2022 to current, uh, I think is uh, illustrative of how the recovery is progressing. And if you go down to about the middle of that page and you look at reference questions, that's over 40% higher mm -hmm. year over year. So the people are coming in and they're not just uh, checking out a book and running home. They're uh, utilizing the staff. They're asking questions. 
And, uh, you know, that's, that's wonderful. That's what they're there for. And I think <laughs> that's the kind of thing that um, we can use to justify additional staffing, uh, additional mm -hmm. money for staffing. Uh, when we can say, hey, look, uh, about 50% more people <laughs> came in and over 40% more questions involved in use of the staff. So, um, you know, putting those two together, I think, gives us a good picture of what's happened over the last 24 months. May I ask along those lines, when we reach April and we're pulling the March data, would you still like to see the 2020 data despite our closing on March 13th? When you say the, the 2020 data, you mean the 2019-2020? Uh, well, it will be, it can be 2000, it can be 2019, 2020, or it can be 2020 to 2021. Either way, it will reflect the month of March when we closed mid through. Well, I think since we're looking at 12 month periods in this context, I would say the 2019-2020 12 month period even if it includes March of 2020, because uh, you know, like like investing in stocks, you don't look at it day to day unless you're a day trader. But if you're in to really invest, you look at it over a much longer period of time. And so, uh, I would like to see those 12 months to answer your question, Francesca. <laughs> but I don't care about 2018, 2019. A lot of those numbers are very similar to 2019, 2020. Anyhow, as we look at the chart tonight. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from trustees? All righty, then let's move on to trustee comments. One stand out in the cold. <laughs> and Jamie talking to her cat. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Dinner was requested. I appreciate your outdoor cat. It rid my back. It rid my backyard of the gopher that was decimating my planter box. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I attended the uh, ceremony for the for the mural, and it was lovely. There were zillions of people there, and it was a warm, wonderful day. I'm also looking forward to the wine and chocolate this weekend so hope to see you all there thank you uh trustee moreau uh yes uh, I, I think it's exciting I, I was talking to diane yesterday and she said they were going to try to cap the cap the tickets at 300 because that's probably all the library will hold and it sounds like they may actually get pretty close to that um if you didn't um Donate your Prosecco um, if there's still time. And um, they've decided since the library's closed on Sunday and Monday to do the cleanup on Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. So anybody who has nothing else to do on <laughs> Sunday at one o'clock, um, mm -hmm. feel free to come on over and help clean up. Trustee Petty. Uh just overall observation that uh, the recovery uh, isn't finished, but we're moving along uh, well, and progressing well, very, very well. And that um, I'm not sure with the uh, change in technology, we should ever expect numbers like uh, persons walking through the front door to ever reach what it was three years ago, because so many people are using other methods and using the library services in other ways. But I think to continue the expansion of the variety of things that we offer and programs and services online, remotely, in person, off campus and everything, uh, th those are all just um, exciting, very rewarding kinds of uh, changes and reflects the innovation that I'd been hoping would come out of the downtime we had uh, uh, during the pandemic and we, weren't doing things and we're coming out of it with not just flipping the on switch and going back to going back to normal, but we're creating uh, what we hope will become a new normal where it, it doesn't end. Everything is changing. Thank you. Arish. 
I'm looking forward to all of you being there on the Saturday. <laughs> I'll be at the strawberries, uh, the uh, chocolate fountain with strawberries. <laughs> Most welcome to visit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to end by saying how pleased I am. I, I feel like we're coming back to life. Uh, Brian, you're just doing great. I feel like you hit the ground running. <laughs> just looking at your port report makes me tired. I remember the old days when I used to have energy like that. No more. <laughs> but it's good to see. Uh, and I'm really glad uh, at the level of community engagement. I think that's really important if we're going to have people supporting us and uh, what we're doing. It's important that you're the face of the library and out doing that. Um, my only other comment is I was doing a little personal research project the other day and I had more fun going on to the library website and accessing electronic resources. It's cool. I haven't done that for a while since, you know, I'm not teaching, I'm not going to school, but just going in and fussing around and having fun was great. So thank you. <laughs> and if there's nothing else um then let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 5 24 p.m thank you all and i look forward to unless my cold gets worse seeing you on uh, saturday <laughs>